Well, to start it off, I want to start the presser off with asking you all a question. Me and Coach BK actually do, throughout the draft process, we always ask the prospects coming in this question here. So I just kind of want to get y'all thoughts on it. Do you hate to lose or love to win? Show of hands, hate to lose. Show hands. Love to win. I love to win. And, you know, it's no right or wrong answer to it. But, you know, as a prospect coming out of college, most of them, a majority of the answers are you hate to lose, hate to lose because of the feeling that it gives to you. But, you know, I say to those prospects, where well, you have an experience with a winning locker room is like in the NFL, right? And so – the margin of error is so minuscule when it comes to winning and losing games in this league. And it's so hard, regardless of who you're up against, whether it's a backup quarterback or who's playing for the opposing teams. I mean, Coach BK brought it up to me before I came down here. 15 out of the 16 games this past weekend was a one possession game in the fourth quarter. And so you start talking about margin of error when it comes to winning and losing in this league. And winning is contagious. And winning is really, really hard. And through this four-game juncture, we find ourselves at 3-1. and one. Um, Obviously, new regime, new coaching staff, new schemes being, put, being installed. We didn't play any of our starters in the preseason. So you could kind of say, you know, those first three games, three or four games is our preseason. And you look at the tape and our identity is starting to show – and for us as a team, I think it's really encouraging of, of what you see on tape and where we're headed. Uh, and I'm really excited about it. I uh, have to throw a big shout out to G Money, uh, Greg, uh, being named NFC Special Teams Player of the Week. That's an unbelievable job and truly p pays off of what he's done this offseason, uh, how he's went about his process, how he's able to bounce back off the year that he had. And, you know, he just continues to answer the, answers the call. Um, you know, unfortunately, we did lose Lou uh, to the broken leg. Uh, you know, it's funny because well, it's not funny, but I actually had that same exact injury when I was playing. And so I was able to connect connect with Lou um, when we actually TD'd. I had texted him, and he called me around 2.20, 2 2.30 in the morning. And, you know, I kind of just shared my experience with him because I also broke my leg, tip, feel, man, dislocated my ankle my second year in the NFL. And so I kind of understand what he's going through, that trauma. Uh, I know the way that he is built, uh, you know, majority of the process, the rehab process is more mentally than it is a physical aspect of it. And so we just got to make sure we do a good job as a coaching staff of really loving him up, providing him with that support that he needs. And I'm excited to get Lou back. Glad that he had a successful surgery. Uh, you know, we were able to get on the Zoom call with him yesterday to wish him a happy birthday. And, you know, he's all smiles and really in good spirits. And so I'm really encouraged by that. Um, but overall, just kind of looking back at the game, uh, you know, we continue to just find ways. You know, we don't get that blessing of being fortunate enough to have 60, 70 plays in a game. And so you look at a special team standpoint, each and every play can swing the game one way or another. Like one critical error can literally dictate the win, the, a win of a game or a loss of a game. And so for us, the mindset going into it is for us to continue to have a positive impact on the football game every single time we step out there. Because one critical error, we might not have an opportunity to return another kick, or we might not have another opportunity to cover a kick because you know, offense might not score or however the case may be. And so each and every rip that we have, we have to find a way to maximize that opportunity. And, you know, through the four weeks, I feel like we've we've done that. We found a way to be consistent in our approach and how we practice. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about our practice habits, especially leaning on those practice squad guys. And they continue to show up for us. And, and so I got to pay heavy dividends to those guys because they're really the ones that's making the games easy for those 48 who are dressed. Uh, so, so I really appreciate them. Uh, and with that, I open up for questions. What was it like for you coming back from that injury? Uh, you said it was a similar injury as Lewis. Yeah, it was. And, and the thing about it is, is that I actually tore my ACL the year before that in London. So it was week eight, my rookie year. We we're playing the Patriots, and I actually tore my ACL and my MCL. Uh, rehab back from the ACL MCL, and week two, I was playing back at home in Atlanta, and the return ended up falling on me and I broke 
tib fib dislocated my ankle on the same exact knee that I tore my ACL on. So the the road to recovery was div very difficult for me. But again, the biggest thing on recovering from that was the mental aspect. You you have to find a way to to not get down and ask yourself like why me? Why you know why me? And I think that's kind of where I found myself going was trying to figure out well, why was this happening to me after having a college career where I, I was pretty clean, no injuries, and then I come into this league and it's back-to-back -back years. I end up having season-ending injuries. And so for me, I lean heavily on my family, my teammates. Uh, they really helped me pick me up. And, you know, they provided me with the support that I needed mentally in order to help me get through it. And so, and, and that's, the, that's going to be the biggest challenge for Lewis is the mental aspect of it and really not asking himself, you know, why is this happening to me? You rehab that whole year and then the following year, um, were you still rehabbing or just looking at your uh, pro football reference uh, guy and doesn't have you with anybody in 2014? In 2014, I was released by the Rams, and I ended up on the Jacksonville Jaguars practice squad about week eight. You were and then I, that yeah, I was ready by that next season. Yep, correct, correct. And I didn't, um, I, I ended up around like I didn't become truly ready until like week three of the preseason is when I really started playing in like games. What was your thought process, mental frame of mind before that fake punt? Uh, well, you know, the, the way the way it was, uh, we repped it so many times. Uh, I was confident in it. It was just a matter of getting the look that we wanted uh, and just trusting trusting Metellus and trusting Mr. Wright to go out there and execute it. We had to be a little bit patient because they did show a double vice out there on Speedy. Uh, and so Metellus did a great job of staying patient, uh, just kind of waiting for that guy to come in. Uh, you know, we kind of expected it. It was a fourth and two. Highly unlikely that a uh, return team would stay in a six box right there with knowing with the possible of a direct snap to the PP where we're able to just go and get an easy two yards. And so Mattel is just having great, great situational awareness right there, understanding where that guy's going to come back in. And from there, it's just executing it. Just knowing, I mean, you know, we practice it on weeks in, and I mean, it, Speedy is open every single time, even though. The corner that was guarding him in practice knew that it was coming. He still couldn't stop it. And so for us, it was just a matter of execution. Mr. Wright did an unbelievable job. You know, he kind of short on him. I came to the sideline like, hey, he kind of short on him that, you know, I'm on, I'm, I'm on him about it. But I go back and look at the tape, and he's got Taysom Hill right there in his face with his hands up. And it's really an unbelievable job by him uh, getting it over and CJ Ham kicking like a right tackle to try to go get Taysom just so he isn't able to affect the throw. So, you know, hats off to those guys. Again, you know, uh, I'm a big fan of rookies, and for it to be a rookie to a rookie, you know, that, that just puts a big smile on my face. Coach, can you talk about handing out the special teams caps this year and just the pride that guys have being on the special teams? It seems to be the most pride since all the years I've been covering the team. Oh, yeah, yeah. for sure. And, and, you know, that's that's what we're all about. Uh, you know, I talk about the connection, the chemistry, and the communication. And, and for us, that chemistry aspect is everything, right? Trying to truly get to know your guys. I mean, special teams is the only phase of the game where offense and defense are guys truly blend with one another on a daily basis in the meeting room, on the practice field and off of the practice field, quite frankly. And so, you know, I, I always always try to find it important for us. How can we continue to jail one another? How can, can, how can we continue to build this chemistry? And so the special teams has just a note to those guys for to, to, that we are one, you know, that we are one. And let's continue to build this thing out. Let's continue to bond with one another. Let's continue to create this atmosphere of leaning on one another and trusting one another right there on the, on the football field. And, and most importantly, it's just a level of respect. Uh, you know, I say it all the time, you know, respect your teammate. Chris Boyd seems like he's a big energy guy, big personality guy. How, how cool was it to see him make a play like he did beating a double team, recovering and, and forcing a fumble like Yeah, I had a, actually had a conversation with KB yesterday, and, you know, he was up front and honest with me saying, like, hey, I, this is probably the most that I have prepared and watched tape and truly – indulge and invested in time and actually watching tape and you see you see that time that he's putting in the preparation that he's putting in paying off on the football field I mean that guy is is electric the way that he's able to, to defeat vice and put guy work edges on on zeros uh, it truly shows up I mean the guy plays with his hair on fire you know sometimes we got to kind of 
got to put the leash on him a little bit there. But, you know, when the time comes, he's always go more. He's the one that kind of makes it – I mean, he he's the one that makes it go. But I can say that about a, a lot of guys, Metellus, CJ, Patrick Jones is showing up, Troy Dye. I mean, the way that this roster is built, unbelievable job by Quace and KO and the personnel staff where we are really deep in a lot of positions. And, and you know, it makes my job and Coach Kawitka's job a lot easier uh, to call plays out there knowing that, you know, we can feel good about whatever call because those guys are going to get it done. Uh, but Chris Boyd has been an electric force. Uh, to see him go out there, the preparation that he has, how he attacks practice, uh, you can see that work ethic just translate right over into the game. Matt, you talk about the mentality of Lou and try to get him through that. What did you have to do for the rest of the team when you lost him since you guys are so tight? Because it seemed a little bit like the you know, air was deflated, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. For that. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is, is – um, you know, we went into it. Uh, there was a little bit of a lull period there when we did lose Lou. And, you know, that is where you start talking about player-led teams versus versus coach-led teams. And coach-led teams don't go very far in this league. Player-led teams do. And so when we did hit that lull period, that's where you see Josh Metellus start to step up. You see Kirk Cousins starting to step up to where he's communicating with the defense. Hey, guys. We got your back, okay? You get a stop here. You get a turnover here. We're going to find a way to convert it. And so that's where we really start to lean on players to pick us up on the sideline rather than it's coaches who run or trying to get us going. That's where we lean on the leadership, the veteran guys, the Brian O'Neills, the Kirk Cousins, the Harrison Smiths. You know, those guys were the ones who really were able to kind of rev it up a little bit on the sideline to get the team going and kind of get the momentum back where we wanted it to. Hey Matt, what stood out to you just about your kickoff coverage and being able to keep the opposing starting spot pretty far back? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's that, that's that's kind of the, the the mindset that we have at the end of the day. Uh, again, I, I'm confident we have a lot of speed. The combo with speed and power that we have out there on the kickoff coverage is really encouraging. Uh, also with Greg's, the hang time plus the distance and the direction of putting it outside the numbers. Uh, Coach Kawika actually just did a study. It's funny. I I actually don't want to say never mind, never mind. I don't want, no, I don't want to mention I don't want to mention it. But um I will, I will actually. Um interesting stat for you that there has not been, I don't know if it's ever or in the past ten years, but any ball that's been caught outside of the numbers hasn't hasn't went for a touchdown ever. And so, you know, what what does that say where, you know, direction is 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 huge for us. And so Greg's ability to put those balls outside the numbers creates even more havoc and confusion and makes it even harder for the return team to be able to go ahead and return that football. And so again, you know, we have elite flying, penetrating guys out there. I mean, a lot of guys just it feels like they're unblockable. And and they feel that way. And so for us to be able to go out there, pin guys in the twenty uh, you know, that's just a mindset thing. I mean, we, 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 again, I'm looking for competition addicts, and those guys want to compete. And, you know, usually in the huddle, I'm, I, they, they tell me, I'm like, hey, y'all, you want to put it in play? Y'all want to kick a touchback? How y'all feeling? You know, sometimes, ah, you know, I'm starting to cramp up a little bit. Hey, let's put this one out. Okay, fine. Let's, let's do it. You know, otherwise, it's, man, let's go. Let's roll. Let's put it in play. And I trust those guys to make that decision. If they feel good about it, I feel great about it. And so kick it away. Away we go. Matt, uh, sorry if you already addressed this in an earlier session, but how did you get the nickname Hat? Oh, so I got the nickname Hat. It actually started uh, in college my freshman year. So I had broke the face mask of our starting running back in a scrimmage my freshman year. And after I broke it, they said, dang, Matt lays the hat. And so I became Matt the Hat because I hit people really hard. And so that name kind of just carried uh, throughout my playing career. And it's kind of just trickled over into my uh, my coaching career. So everybody calls me Hat, Coach Hat. And that's kind of how I got the name Hat. Yeah. yeah. I'm always big on the why. There's got to be a why behind everything. So yeah. I obviously have a role in, in figuring out your own kicker's distance. But how do you go about just really trying to gauge, like, Ed mentioned the opponents. Like you, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So we always go into it, and our personnel personnel department does a great job on pre scout looks. So, uh, Coach Marge was uh, the pre scout look last week, and we have a conversation every Monday after he watches the opponents' game prior to us playing them. And so I always want to engage with him on okay, what does his pre game routine look like? Uh, you know, outside game, indoor game. 
Uh, was he confident? Was he confident in hitting it when he was 40 out, 50 out? Did he have the ability? You know, was he missing it left, missing it right? Uh, what was the trajectory of the ball? And so I get a good, I get a good diagnosis pre uh, before the week before we play them uh, on the yardage lines, and then my eyes kind of tell me and confirm that once we're in the pregame and I'm kind of watching his routine, how is he hitting it? And, you know, Lutz in pregame was hitting 63 yards, 64 yards, and quite frankly, he was more accurate from distance than he was from shorter uh, field goals. And so, you know, prior to the game, I kind of give our – game our game management coordinator Ron Cordell as well as uh Ed kind of what that line is and how I feel like gotta have it situations or you know end of half situations or you know quite frankly where it's just in the routine of a, a in the game right and so we kind of lay out three different type of lines and so for the end of the game it's like hey Ed this guy you know, you, you just hit a 60-yarder, but, you know, hey, the line right here is going to be right around the 45. I mean, this guy can confidently probably hit it from 63 out, and, you know, it'll be good. And, you know, Lutz, you know, we, we got lucky on the double point. Thank you. Thank, thank goodness for that.